Friends, uh, today I want to talk to you about why we should be very concerned about the epidemic of chronic conditions that is sweeping our country. Now, some of you may not be familiar with this word chronic conditions. Chronic conditions are basically health conditions that affect us for significant sections of our lives. They include very diverse conditions like diabetes, hypertension, depression, alcohol abuse, and a range of other health conditions that we traditionally call non-communicable diseases. Now, I'm pretty sure that every single one of you here today either knows someone who's affected by such a condition or is already living with one. Put together, these conditions already are the leading causes of death and disability in India, and it is predicted that this burden will grow exponentially in the years ahead. But today, I want to talk to you about what worries me the most, and I think what should worry all of us, which is how our current healthcare system responds to the needs of people affected by a chronic condition. But I also want to leave you with some hope. Hope about an innovative alternative that can be different for the future. And I want to start with a story about my mother. My mother was born in Gujarat nearly 80 years ago. She was married in her teens and then went on to have three children in rapid succession. The first two were girls and I was the youngest. My mother remembers after the birth of the second child how disappointed the rest of the family was. Remember, we are a very patriarchal society and that continues to this day. But she also remembers how no one came to the hospital after the second child was born and that she had to bring her daughter home alone. She remembers how difficult that period of her life was and how soon after my sister was born, she started developing sleep problems. This was when her doctor started her on sleeping medicines. I think, looking in hindsight, my mother feels that this is also when her depression actually began, but this was only diagnosed much later in her life. Soon afterwards, she started drinking alcohol as a way to help her sleep. Many decades later, she started developing the early symptoms of diabetes, and this is when her alcohol dependence was also formally diagnosed. Then she had another decade before her depression was formally diagnosed by a psychiatrist, 30 years after when we think it actually began. About a decade later, she developed the first serious complication of her diabetes. She had a first of several strokes. Some years later, she finally stopped drinking, much due to effort not only of her own willpower, but due to the effort of her husband. She later went on to develop cancer of the colon, which required surgery, and then she developed further complications of her diabetes when her kidneys stopped functioning so that she now has to have daily dialysis. And last year, she developed gangrene of the foot that required amputation of her toes. You can see here an amazing, amazing story about a life lived with chronic diseases. And yet, through all of this experience, she has had to deal with multiple hospitals, multiple specialists, each one, it seems, specializing in a specific disease or in a specific part of her body. Each time, she's had to go into hospital and spend large amounts of money that have led to my father having to sell assets in order to pay for her health care. And one of the reasons why she has to spend a lot of money is because of the number of medicines that she has been prescribed by various doctors. This is one example of a prescription, and I have counted 24 different medicines that she has received on this one encounter. Yet, while she is miserable, at least she is fortunate to be alive. And I say this because my mother's caretaker once told her that in her village, most people, with even just one of the problems that my mother had, would have died a long time ago. Because, indeed, we do live not in one country, 
but in two Indias. Not just in other respects of our lives, but also in the respect of healthcare. A small section of India experiences this kind of healthcare. Hospitals that could easily double up as five-star hotels. Hospitals that pride themselves as being homes of super specialists. No other part of the world is this word super specialist used than in India. But for the vast majority of India, this is the kind of healthcare they receive. Decrepit health centers that are short of basic amenities and medicines, and where the human resources are demotivated and unskilled. It isn't surprising that the poor start off in the public system, but rapidly lose hope, and then they'll go to the private system. But in the private system, they don't necessarily receive good care either. In this particular slide, which is a busy one, a group of researchers looked at the kind of care people received when they went into hospital with a heart attack and looked at the proportion of people who received a various investigation or a treatment according to how rich they were. This was in the same hospital. I want you to look at just one example of a particular intervention, and this is an angiogram. If you look at the extreme left of your slide amongst the rich, you will see that about 40% of the rich received an angiogram. But if you look at the extreme right, the poorest people, only about 8% did, about a quarter of that number. This is for the same health problem in the same hospital. Now, one reason why the poor receive less healthcare is because they can't afford it. And the cost of healthcare is something that worries me deeply. On this slide, you can see the incredible inflation in the cost of healthcare for a variety of different chronic conditions over a 10 year period. Indeed, the inflation in healthcare, most of this expenditure, of course, is out of pocket. And mind you, out of pocket expenditure isn't only in the private sector, even in the public sector, you have to still buy most of your medicines. The healthcare inflation in India has outstripped inflation for all other items of life. It isn't surprising when you have to spend so much on your health care that you're going to suffer some pretty serious consequences economically. This slide shows you the economic impact by income group for a single episode of hospitalization for a heart attack. I've just highlighted the bars that are important for us, which are to do with India. Here again you see the sample of patients being divided according to how rich they are. The dark bars describe the proportion of people who had catastrophic health spending, which simply means spending more than 50% of your monthly e income on that single episode of hospitalization. And the gray bars reflect to you distress financing. That is to say that you had to sell an asset or mortgage an asset in order to actually find that money. What is amazing about this slide is that irrespective whether you're poor or rich, more than half of all Indians have had catastrophic health spending because of a episode of hospitalization, and nearly half or more have had to sell or mortgage an asset to find money to pay for this. In the case of the poor, catastrophic health spending is affecting 80% of the poor. What a shocking statistic. Clearly, we cannot go on like this. We really do need to find an alternative model of care. Care that moves away from a focus on super specialists in their super specialty hospital to that actually focuses on the needs of people who are affected by chronic conditions. What is often now called person-centered care. And there are two key elements of person-centered care that I want to share with you today. The first is focusing care on primary care, integrating the management of chronic conditions, not in super specialty hospitals, but in what we used to call the family physician or in primary care. And the second is to address multiple conditions in the same patient, rather than deal with each condition like it is a separate disease. Let me start with first examining the prospects of integration into primary care. Now, 
there are two very important challenges that we've had to address when we try to integrate the chronic disease agenda in primary care. The first is the very weak human resource capacity. Our primary health centers are already very short of skilled doctors and nurses, of medicines, of technologies. To add the management of chronic diseases to this already scarce environment is going to be a huge challenge. And secondly, our healthcare system more generally has been focused on the management of acute conditions, for example, fevers and accidents. We're simply not prepared in primary care for the needs of people with chronic conditions. It is for this reason that in the West, an innovative new approach has been tried out to integrate chronic disease management in primary care, and this is called collaborative care. Collaborative care has five key elements to it that you proactively detect conditions like diabetes because they're often hidden before they cause complications, that you tailor the complex interventions, typically a combination of medicines and lifestyle changes, you tailor them to the individual. One size does not fit all. That you have a long-term perspective because these are chronic conditions and you support people to take their medicines and to have the behavior change that is needed that you're concerned not only with medical outcomes, but also social outcomes. Is the person back at work, for example? And you put the person at the center of your concern, not at the periphery, as shown very nicely in this particular diagram. The patient is at the center of a team, a team that comprises the primary care professionals, the specialists, and very importantly, a new human resource called the case manager. Now, in the West, case managers have traditionally been social workers, but of course, they're very short of that human resource in India as well. And about a decade ago, I began to experiment with applying this collaborative care model for the management of mental disorders and neurological disorders in India. I first asked myself the question, who could be this case manager? In the absence of a professional category of human resources, I decided to start working with ordinary people people with no prior health training. And with specific task-based training, incorporated them into a collaborative care model for conditions as diverse as depression, dementia, schizophrenia, and just last month, our first trial on autism. What did these case managers do? Here is a description of some of the key roles that these lay people performed with training and supervision. They supported families, they educated the patient, they even just befriended people with chronic conditions because so often these individuals become quite isolated and alone. They helped them detect early relapse and instituted early referral. They promoted healthy behaviors and where needed, they provided psychological treatments. You can find more about these different trials within this book. But suffice to say, we were able to demonstrate the effectiveness, the safety, and the economic advantages of this kind of collaborative care for a range of mental health conditions. However, we now need to go beyond this individual condition to examine how we can extend the model of collaborative care to handle multiple conditions. And the good news, the good news is we already know how we can do that. Why should we do it? because it's very common. On this slide, you can see how common multiple morbidities are in a number of different countries. If you look at the first row, you'll see the figures for India, and you will see that one-fifth of all adult Indians today have two or more chronic conditions. In the West, people have already shown how the collaborative care model can be utilized to manage multiple morbidities through a primary care platform. In these trials, very different conditions like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, depression, and alcohol use disorders are now being managed in the same individual using the same case manager in a collaborative care approach. Now, we don't actually have such evidence from India as yet, but we're busy building that evidence. Next month, we will launch the largest trial in this country, in Haryana and Karnataka, of an integrated health system management program that integrates the management of diabetes, heart disease, depression, and drinking problems using a mobile health platform that supports, through decision support and electronic medical record support, nurses and primary care doctors. And here you can see an image of such a uh, trial user in progress. 
But I want to now end with thinking about the larger ecosystem that individuals with chronic conditions live in. And that is, of course, the family. The family is the primary source of care for all people with chronic conditions. In my mother's case, and on this slide, you can see her looking quite well. This picture was taken last year. She's actually looking well because her care is now managed by her primary care doctor, who has, amongst the various things that he's done, has removed half the medicines that she was on. But another reason why she's looking happy is because of something you cannot see on this slide, and that is my father, the man with whom she has lived for more than half her life, and who has stood by her through all her various episodes of chronic diseases. And during all this time, he has himself started developing a range of chronic diseases, obesity, back problems, and most recently, diabetes. What strikes me as amazing is that every time he's taken my mother to see the specialist in the super specialty hospital, not only has that specialist completely ignored my mother's various other health problems other than what their specialty taught them, but they have not once asked my father, how do you cope with this? How is your health? It is this narrow-minded approach to chronic conditions that we need to challenge. One of the things we've been doing in our new center in Delhi is really examining how common are chronic conditions within the same household. That is to say, if I had a chronic condition, how much greater risk is there that somebody else in my household would have that condition? And there's good reasons, of course, for there to be multiple morbidities in a household. We share the same environment, for example, the same diet. There is a stress of caring for someone with a chronic condition. And so we looked at this data set uh, from three South Asian cities and found that the increased risk of a chronic condition was 80% greater, clearly showing that there was a clustering of these conditions in the same household. We need to look beyond the individual and into their families. So that if we're going to re-engineer the way we approach chronic diseases, we need to move from the treatment of specific diseases by specialists to integrating the management of these diseases in primary care, to beginning to recognize the nature of multiple morbidities rather than having to refer individuals to multiple doctors, and ultimately to having a community-based model of care for these conditions. Imagine this blue box is a district. At the heart of this is the district hospital where all the specialists are based with all their sophisticated technology and wizardry. These hospitals need to support a group of primary health care centers that reach out in the community where you have fully empowered doctors and nurses who in turn work with outreach workers or frontline workers who are directly supporting people in their own homes. This is the model of health care we need. A model that we're trying to champion in our center in Delhi, which we call the 4C Center, the Center for the Control of Chronic Conditions, which focuses on four principles of care. That it's collaborative, that it's coordinated across sectors, that it is continuing across a person's life, and that it is community-based. I end with this wonderful um, story that Laura Gilpin tells us. She's one of the champions of person-centered healthcare. And she says, she's really explaining why even in the US, we've been so uh, deficient in organizing care around people's own needs. And she says, what patients want is not rocket science, which is really unfortunate because we're pretty good at rocket science. We're great at rocket science. What we're not good at are the things that are so simple and basic that we often overlook them. Thank you very much.